wow, it's really intense to see the film. Um, I just, you know, just the, I mean, I'm reminded of, I spent six weeks um, in Jerusalem just trying to get Orthodox rabbis to speak to me um, about homosexuality. And I remember just, you know, spending years hearing people's stories, you know, being this kind of, you know, I believe that a documentary filmmaker is a, is a shliach, is a, is a messenger, um, and that's a deep responsibility. And I, so many people were so scared to speak to Orthodox rabbis, and I felt like I had to be that, that, that witness. And, um, and I went to rabbi after rabbi who hung up the phone, who slammed the door, f you know, over weeks. And at one point, I just remember um, just having this, like, hyperventilating and feeling like if I don't get married to a woman, I'm going, I will not have kedusha. I will not have holiness in my life. And it was like this, this, tiny moment where I felt what so many people that I had, you know, met and spent so much time with felt every day. Um, and I called Devorah, um, who is the married ultra-Orthodox lesbian who has the many children in the film, and she sort of calmed me down and I sort of spun back into, um, but it was a very, it's a, it was just to even make the film was holding a lot of pain and holding a lot of s tension and struggle be or in holding sin. And it was, it was, you know, it took six years to make and, and only very, very few people who are as brave as David was and is to, you know, to come forward and share their story. You were, you were such a groundbreaker. Well, um, <coughs> I really, excuse me, I really have to thank you, Sandy, for uh, being gr so groundbreaking in making this film. I mean, I was, knowing myself, I was more, when I realized that I was gay, I mean, I grew up, like I said, in the movie Orthodox, and I grew up in a very closet, not closet, very Orthodox community in Chicago, and I only went to Orthodox Jewish day schools and my only people that I knew, everybody was Orthodox. I didn't know anybody that wasn't even Jewish. Um, and the only gay person I knew was my mom's effeminate hairdresser, who I was repulsed by. And that was what gay was to me, my mom's hairdresser, Jimmy. And um, so even though I, knew on a certain level and when I was in high school that I had these feelings, I couldn't, I didn't have the knowledge to label it. I was, it was, if you would have told me in high school, David, you're gay, accept it, I wouldn't have even have blushed because I would have said, no, I'm not gay. The effeminate hairdresser of my mom, that's what gay is. And I just thought I had feelings that I didn't know what that attraction meant and I thought, the ability to recognize beauty in women was heterosexuality. So I was really completely um, innocent and naive. And I didn't realize that I was 19 where I went to university and I went to the Jewish Hillel and next to the Hillel was the gay student organization. And I, th I remember thinking very clearly God, how could people openly in daylight walk into the gay student association? Aren't they embarrassed? And then I saw a guy that looked like a regular guy that was attractive, was one of my classes, and I saw him walk into the gay student organization, and I thought, why would he walk in there? He's normal. And I thought, oh, shit. Excuse that's, I mean, I said the F word. Um, you can be normal and gay. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head. And it's strange to think that how could I, how could this be true with what, what I'm saying? But it's the truth. I, I was, I led, I always call where I grew up Anatevka with cars. That's how she, that's what I grew up. I grew up in Anatevka. It was, um, you know, we, we, we just knew one way of life. 
Everybody kept kosher, everybody kept Shabbos, everybody got married, everybody had children, no one was divorced. I never heard about anything that wasn't, quote, the norm. But then when I realized, I realized, okay, like I said in the movie, and um, I took this rabbi's advice, and I went on this twen- this uh, ten year. I was in therapy for ten years, tried to become straight, and it went. The way I met Sandy was Sandy presented this as a work in progress at Outfest, and when I saw the ten minutes of trembling before God, it just grabbed me by the throat, and, I, and for some reason I just felt. I went up to Sandy and I said. I should be in your film because this <coughs> describes my life, and I was, and I, w- I'm, I'm not a person that advertised it at all. I mean, I it was only my sister that knew for ten years, and I was extremely private. But I just felt compelled, and that this was a perfect venue for me to help myself and help others in this huge, huge issue, which was never discussed really before. So it was, it was uh, a gift, really, a huge gift, Sandy. Thank you. How has your life been after the film came out? What would hap- what effort was released? Um. I remember I was nervous because I was afraid that, because it was for three months at the theater on Sunset and Crescent Heights. Mm-hmm. And I was mortified that people at work would see me or that, I didn't know how this was going to impact my life. Would I get fired? Would I? Um, and and also it was shown around the country and around the world and in Israel. And my whole Israeli family found out because it was on Sunday night television there in, in the 6 p.m. movie. And um, so basically it came out to my whole high school and everybody I knew through Sandy. So you saved me a lot of phone calls. <laughs> and um, And so it was a little bit of a relief that, I didn't want people to say, oh, David's gay. I wanted them to be strapped in their seats and listen to the whole story. Because right. it's very easy to label mock. Like, like the rabbi says, the rabbi with the uh, slick black hair, and he says, it's very easy to demonize and dehumanize. But once you know someone, it's difficult to do that. And so when I s- know that people can see and hear the whole story and struggle, it's it's more than just saying, you see someone, I'm gay, they, okay, whatever. But if th- when I understand through this movie, which was done so amazingly well, I mean, the editor, Susan Corder, I met her, I had, no, I had known nothing about movies. I knew nothing about making movies. And the way she edited this movie, it transformed, I mean, it was, I mean, you made an amazing movie, but editing it is so hard, I didn't know. And she just did such an amazing job just splicing it and make and really giving it such power and such depth. So how it's changed me. Uh, well, right now my, I'm here with my spouse of three years. We got, mar- we got married actually, um, I think a little over a month after it got legalized mm-hmm. in California. So that's a big thing. Um, that's a very good thing. And because um, when I see the movie, I say, do I live my life alone and celibate? My relative in Israel, when he said when he saw the rabbi, he wanted to scream and strangle the rabbi. What he what he what he said to me because it was really one of the things. There were a few things that I wanted the public to know is that rabbis and people don't get it. They don't. He says, "Well, everyone's got their struggle in life. Like I struggle not having sex with all these women I'm married. Well, yeah, yeah, but you have sex with your wife, and people just don't get it. Okay, you could not eat ham sandwiches. Yeah, but you can eat." Corn beef sandwiches. So people, so many people come back with that same argument. Like, no, that's not the same thing. And there are so many things that I wanted made um, uh, the film to express. That even the struggle, you, you, everyone's got the struggle. You just have to like that psycho- psychologist. Like to meet if they meet that guy someday. Um, it just amazed. I don't know how he feels today, but. The way that he says this is a, his ideal of what a, what a orthodox person is to be on anti androgen <laughs> therapy. I, 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 you know, I, but that, this was 20 years ago. I don't know how he feels today. So um, my life is very, very different. You know, I still have, I, since I, what you grow up with, you still have those hangs. And I've, all my friends, uh, my, most of my friends are straight and married with children. 
And my closest friends are all live in Israel that I grew up with because we grew up in a very Zionistic school, and they all live in Israel and got married and have children. And so I want to go with Claudio to their houses. Uh, we go on Sabbath and holidays and meals, and and um, I feel like they, it's com I'm completely embraced. We are completely embraced. And, um, yeah, so it's I it's 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 a road that I grow, and I'm still growing, and I still have ways to grow. But this was definitely a big kick in the um, – to surge me forward to self-acceptance. And also I feel proud that to – with you that this has been, a, I think, a huge contribution to – so many people that have struggled with the same issue or with other issues where they don't feel that they belong. So. Yeah, Sam, you've spent, I mean, after the film premiered at Sundance, it was, you were saying it was three straight years of, I mean, even probably even more than that, of traveling the world with this film and creating dialogue and meeting people. And what was that, what was that period like? What was that experience like? It was definitely, um, you know, it was a roller coaster. Um, you know, there were just hundreds of people who would just cry on my shoulder and, you know, parents who, who had disowned their children saw the film and started speaking to them again. Um, we convened, um, I mean, all of us were on the road at various points, Rabbi Steve Greenberg and David and Michelle, and um, we convened the first ever um, Orthodox Mental Health Conference on Homosexuality which was like a secret underground conference for Hasidic, Orthodox, psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, for some people, if anyone knew they were there, um, they would have lost their jobs and everything. Um, we trained 12 facilitators in Jerusalem. Um, they went out and did screenings in private for 2,000 principals, teachers, and school counselors across the entire country to prepare for that Israeli TV broadcast. Um, the head of that project um, friend of mine, she wanted to share the film with her fiance, and she shared it with him. And afterwards, he turned to her and he said, "I'm gay. I can't marry you." Um, so her ma her life was saved. Um, people came out everywhere, um, and then and we took the film really to the largest Jewish communities in the world. We went to Ukraine. Um, to Odessa, to Kiev, to Poland, to Hungary, Australia, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Uruguay, all over Israel, Canada, Holland, Germany, UK. I mean, I was on the road for years. But, you know, the need was so great. I mean, it was like the tipping point, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt like I made a decision that I wasn't going to make another film, I was just going to delay that and then just really serve the burning need um, of so many people. Um, so it was we even had protests um, in front of the Baltimore Theater. We had uh, Orthodox Jews and Evangelical Christians together protesting the film. <laughs> so, you know, we do interfaith work <laughs> wherever we go. Well, David mentioned, you know, the way the film was cut and edited, and it's, and I mentioned it on the stage, it's such a beautiful movie. I really do feel like it's a documentary, but also it's a work of art, it's both, and you found a way to do that. Um, specifically, one of the things that, you know, I think is the most interesting, one of the very interesting things about the film is the way you handle anonymity. I mean, the aesthetics of anonymity, it's probably the warmest, most human, shadows I've seen in a doc. You, I mean, you see documentaries all the time where people are covered up, their voices are altered or whatever, but you you have pottery in front, you have a, the, the, the lace veils, the, the, um, the ceremonies performed in shadow. It transforms our experience of anonymity in a, in, in, in a really powerful way. Can you talk a bit about how you approached that aspect of the film, the, the, the fear people felt and bringing them into the project and then presenting them on screen in that? Yeah, I mean, that device of, you know, having everyone come behind the screen to create their images, that came in the editing room, and I mean, that was just the most, it was like the, it was basically Anatevka. Like, it was like the shtetl that we all wanted to live in, this sort of queer, you know, Hasidic 
shtetl where everyone came. I mean, we had Hasidic people bring their children. I mean, you saw their children, their babies, like their toddlers, payas, like, you know, like it was this whole mix of straight and lesbian and queer and transgender and gay and everyone there. And it was like invisibility illuminated. Like I think one of my favorite moments is when someone passes in front of the, the candle and their shadow becomes illuminated from the inside. And for me, that is like the resonant metaphor, you know, of what sort of, of what, yeah, of what the soul, like how do you represent soul in cinema? How do you represent, you know, rel like religiosity, holy? How do you represent holiness, you know, visually and in cinema? And I think that really touched at something mm -hmm. um, for me that was, aesthetically profound. Um. Well, you're dealing with such, I mean, you're dealing with the fundamental building blocks of humanity, sexuality and spirituality. And one of the things that another, through the aesthetics, through the stories, the way you present the, the stories, the what people share, is you, you start with this idea or idea that you have to be one or the other. You know, you can't be gay and normal, you can't be gay and orthodox, or you can't be gay and spiritual, you can't be, like there's these binary categories. And the, one of the most powerful things about this film is it just, without even, well, I mean, it's said explicitly, but it also on a very, um, I think, unconscious, but you know, conscious level, it, it really attacks the idea, not attacks, it just undermines the idea of binary categories across the board, sexuality, spirituality. I mean, when you were, you know, uh, working with the film, did you, I mean, was there ever a point where you felt overwhelmed with the kind of, the, I mean, the, the depth of the issues that you were dealing with, the feelings? I mean, it just feels, what, I mean, I felt, I sound like I'm gushing, but I, the film just draws out a lot of emotional, I mean, thoughts and feelings. I mean, did you feel the burden of, of representing that in a way? Yeah, and, and I mean, I definitely, you know, there are moments in the editing room where you just close a door and you hurl your head on the table and just weep. Um, I mean, that's what happened. I just, um, I remember just watching the suicide of the lesbian in Israel and just, you know, there's a lot of brokenness mm -hmm. um, and a lot of pain and a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. And... You know, it. I, I mean, I spent ten years making the film, and you know, and moving it around the world, and and then after, just really took like a. It's almost like, in order to, I mean, you've had this experience through your whole life, but but to sit with rabbis and to have to justify your love, um, you know, to even stand. I remember being in front of audiences and trying to, you know, say that, you know, the Torah prohibits anal sex between men, but it's like, you know, and I had to sort of be the voice of, of the Torah and, and almost feel like I was desexualized. Like I had to be this neutral party, sort of convening conversation in the same audience with orthodox straight people and lesbian and gay people and having to hold that tension, you know, in public and, getting blowback and having to kind of, you know, really wrestle um, for years. I think it, I mean, f it took its toll on me. I definitely needed to take time to reunite my mind, body, and soul again and to kind of integrate and, and you know, go on lots of retreats. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think it was, it was very intense. I don't know what you, how you, what that movement for you was like. Well, well yeah, I also question. don't want to underplay, because I think it's very important, the sense of joy in the film, too. I mean, the, the deep joy that people feel that find in connecting with their spirituality, regardless of what the world might tell them, they're, they feel that they're true in their own faith. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I, every time I watch the movie, I think I want to convert. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's the, 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 the sense of joy and pleasure and um, in the film is also just also tremendous. So this is balance of these things. But did you, David, did you, how did you feel watching the film with for the first time or participating in its production, the, these kinds of well, actually aspects I, of I, the no film? I, it's, we were filming together for five years and 
I had no idea things took that long. And, but yet it was, an ama- it was an amazing gift and to be able to, um, sp- the most powerful, it was an amazing gift to participate in the film, to be filmed, to really think deep, because it forces you to really think deeply about so many things. I think a big thing, even more than Judaism, is family, mm-hmm. which is so central in, this, in, in the film the pain of family rejection because you don't fit the mold of what your parents wanted you to be. Mm-hmm. And I got, I don't know, just hundreds of emails and I would say the, the, a significant percentage had nothing to do with homosexuality. People n- not feeling that they fit in. And so, so much of this, I- of this film of course it's about homosexuality and Judaism and finally addressing an issue that was never that was in the closet and was never addressed. So this was groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. And th- probably w- one of the most powerful conversations was in Jerusalem at the place called the Cinematheque. And there I think there probably were 500 people in the audience from and all all c- you know rabbis and people that were religious not religious and um to be in Jerusalem, and it was com- we were completely embraced. You could f- the the love and the acceptance was tangible, in in the air. Mm-hmm. And I remember just feeling. And I, I remember a woman. There was a Holocaust survivor. She gets up and she pulls out her sleeve. Um, she got up in the middle and she showed the number on her arm, and saying what she basically what, what she's been through and like what are we crutching of? What do we com- what do She's been through so much. What we're going through is nothing compared to what she went through. Like, who cares? It doesn't matter what you are. And you just accept yourself. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not an issue. And I thought, well, if I can be accepted, not necessarily from this woman, the example of this woman, but just by to be embraced by rabbis, by peers, by friends in the holy city to me, in the world, in Jerusalem, um, everything else is commentary. And so that, w- that was such a huge gift. And um and th- just the fact that it was shown that it this has been a springboard because this really was the beginning mm-hmm. of of a shift because this was the first time this was really before reality TV 15 years ago I, it wasn't like everything today is reality TV but then it really wasn't so this was really a springboard of opening the door to this to the dialogue so it's caused a lot of change mm-hmm. for the good which, which I think is tremendous, and I'm very proud to be a part of it, and and grateful. So, yeah. and so, I was just thinking. We just David and I just did the 15th anniversary screening in New York, um, at IFC Center, and Michelle was there, um, who you meet in the movie. She's the one who walks through the carnival. Um, I mean, you wouldn't recognize her now. I mean, she's. I think half her size. She had her stomach stapled and and she had a child. And the child's name is Shira, which means song. Uh, Michelle's father was a cantor. She's a singer. And Michelle brought her child to the screening and her child had never seen Trembling Before God before and never saw Michelle in the movie. The child's now nine and was Shira and gender transitioned and is now Cole, is a he. And he just turned to Michelle and said, why is everyone in silhouette? And Michelle said, because they could lose everything. And he said, I'm so happy that I don't have to be in silhouette, that I can be who I am. And I'm so proud that you're my mom and I love you. And and it was just amazing to see this film has now gone to future generations and we're watching the family you know and the history and the legacy and the ancestry being passed down and um, you know at the screening we had JQI Jewish queer youth they were all teenagers they were orthodox they were in yeshivas they were in high schools they were all they came to the film and a week later formed this youth movement that is just they've done so much work with orthodox rabbis pushing them and you know 
petitions and I mean they've really like caused a sea change of this next generation activism and they were all there and now they're you know in their early 30s and so I just there is like you know there was just an uncorking and just this swept movement and the stories are just incredible from all over the world um, of people whose lives and rabbis and communities and families and leaders have changed um, so many orthodox synagogues have shown this film in the synagogues. Um, and it really it became a household word. I think w at one point, guys in yeshiva would turn to each other and go, are you trembling? Like, like are you gay? Like, it just became part of the dictionary. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's, I don't know if it's still on YouTube, but the whole movie, I think it's on, it's on YouTube now. They took it off of Netflix, but now you don't need Netflix. So it's still on YouTube. <laughs> so. um, let's turn it over to the audience. Questions for Sammy or Dan? We have microphones, so wait for the mic to come up to you. And we'll go right here. Thanks. Um, because that was the moment that it was when the movie came out, I would imagine you had a lot of footage. I mean, when you edit a movie, you can't have everything. And you probably filmed some stuff that you loved and weren't able to include in the final cut for a variety of reasons. And I'm wondering if there are things that you didn't include because it was that time that you might include if you were making it today. And if you could tell us a little bit about what you wish you could have included but didn't. I mean, history has catapulted forward. I mean, you know, we're to make this movie now in the era of in the era of marriage equality. You know, I mean, I specifically did not put marriage you know, sort of same-sex marriage in the film. I knew that it would, that would, my whole goal was to break rabbis' hearts. That was the goal. Like, I needed to be so careful. I had the orthodox police on one shoulder, and I had the universal eye on the other. And so I had to make this film be as wide as possible for people of every faith and background, and then I also had to be so precise and careful. Um, so I knew that if I tried to deal with marriage or I tried to really argue Jewish law in the film, and I think cinema is one of the worst places to try to argue law um, in some ways, although some have done it, but, but so I had to really focus on the human story um, because you know most priests, rabbis, ministers will look, imams will look at the verse in the Bible and say, you know, black fire on white fire, black and white, like it's forbidden, you know, bang fist on the table. And and I had to sort of really bring that, that um, this is not just about the verse, this is about Malka and Michelle and David. Um, and, you know, bring the human story to life. And honestly, Jewish law changes through the human story. People go to rabbis with questions, rabbis need to make rulings, and if enough people, if an avalanche of stories go to the rabbis, they have to respond. I mean, that's their, that's their mission. So I think that was definitely the constraints and boundaries that I was holding. Have they responded to um, Yeah, I mean, rabbis have, some rabbis said, I thought I knew, and now I don't know what to say. And they went, quiet and they started to listen and take everything really seriously. Rabbis started writing, Orthodox rabbis, remember Chaim Rappaport wrote a whole book on homosexuality. You know, I mean, there are, I mean, I don't know if you've had experiences with Orthodox rabbis, but many have opened their doors and created safe havens in their Orthodox synagogues um, for lesbian gay people. Um, so it's, you know, there's a huge, I just came from, I mean, I have a special surprise for people here, um, but I'm filming this new film, and I was just in Jerusalem where major Orthodox rabbis were battling it out in public around, hom around some rabbis making completely homophobic statements and other Orthodox rabbis taking them on and in public saying that we need to embrace lesbian gay people. You know, we need to open our doors. We need to, um, you know, I feel like w it's, it's incredible what's happened. Oh, let's go for, let's go in the back here. The man in the white yeah. shirt. 
Yeah, we'll get to you in a second, right now. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I, I, I read the film that you said it was so joyful because I found it to be one of the saddest films I've seen. Uh, the fact that a culture so rich as the, the, the Jewish culture should be so poisonous and hateful the way it is. And I, I think perhaps, and I may be more critical than others, is that I would have presented that in a way where there were more suicides be um, because of what has happened and how they feel. And because it, it is truly a, 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 a poisonous way to in, inculcate this feeling into people. And it makes me uh, ashamed to be a Jew in that way. Uh, and I'm glad to have run from it because I could become any other religion. I cannot, if I'm gay, I'm gay, that's it. But I can become Scientologist, I can become Catholic, anything else. But uh, that's how I feel about it. At least that's what your film, so in, in a way the film is a success for me because you, you bring, but I would have made it stronger, the hate, you were very gentle and very kind and very loving. I think that might be a mistake. Thank you. You know, I mean, look, I had people who saw the film, I had someone in Miami say, I'm Catholic, I'm gay, how can I convert to Orthodox Judaism? You know, and I had a woman you know, start sobbing within the first 15 minutes and run out of the movie and, and say, you know, that she's a reform Jew and, and, you know, and she can't handle this. So, you know, I, we've had the whole spectrum of reaction and I hear you, you know. Well, you know, one of just as, you know, my take on the film and, and I think, um, where the joy, the, the joy that I see in the film comes from, you know, and, and maybe this was a conscious decision. Why would somebody put up with this? If you're gay and they reject you, why go back to them? Just, you know, why would you put, why would you put yourself through that, right? And I think part of what the film does is it says, because there's something real there that they feel that is important to them. And it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's this, and it brings great joy to be able to perform the rituals, to be with your family and perform the rituals. And that connection is why they put up with all of the other crap they have to put up with and, and why they want to be accepted in that, that community because they want to maintain that relationship with God and with their families through God. I mean, that seemed like a very powerful part of the film to me. I mean, I, had, I became more religious because of the film. I mean, I met people like David, people in the film who are Hasidic and Orthodox, who are lesbian or gay, and I was doing Shabbos with them, and I was building a sukkah, and I was, they were teaching me how to lay tefillin, and I was learning songs, and, and I just felt like I w had an entry point into Judaism without the homophobia. So I had, the portal, and I think that's what, you know, for many people like David who grew up with it, you're growing up with the homophobia, but for someone like me who grew up, you know, conservative Jewish and not so religious, like, I, you know, it was a, to be able to study Torah with a Hasidic gay man for two years was, you know, someone who I became very close to, and, um, you know, he opened the tradition to me in a way that I never had access before, so, we all have our journeys. But you've also continued making films and you've taken the kind of, I the exploration to other faith communities and to other, you know, can you talk a little bit about that process and how you, um, you know, the films that you made afterwards, how they might be connected to Trembling Before God? So uh, we, I did a lot of interfaith work with Trembling all over the globe and we did a uh, Muslim Jewish Christian panel in DC and someone approached me saying, I'm Muslim, I'm gay, I have an idea for a movie um, on Islam and homosexuality. You can you give me advice? And I said, absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. I'm happy to give you advice. I became a consultant, then a consulting producer, then a producer, and we made a film called a Jihad for Love um, about uh, Islam and homosexuality with P. 
people from Iran and Egypt and Pakistan and India and um, yeah, and South Africa, the first openly gay imam. Actually, I met him while touring Trembling in South Africa, and we did an interfaith panel with traditional African healers, with um, monks, with ministers, and this imam. And I said, you, you're a gay imam. You have to be in this film that I'm producing. And then I went on this Muslim, gay, lesbian, transgender retreat um, as the only Jew with them. That was pretty an pretty incredible experience. And, um, and that film premiered and you know, did a whole around the world tour and, you know, is being used by everyone from people who are um, judges in asylum cases, immigration officials in Europe and, and the Americas and um, Department of Homeland Security and, you know, is being seen underground in Saudi Arabia and Sudan and Afghanistan. And we had public screenings with that film in Pakistan and Bangladesh and I went to Lebanon, to Beirut, went to Istanbul with the film and you know, so that film had a whole life and yeah, we had extraordinary experiences with people really representing truly every faith, with Sikh, with Buddhist, with indigenous, two-spirit leaders um, mixed in with rabbis everywhere. Um, it was quite a well, you mentioned earlier the special surprise that we have for the audience tonight, which is, uh, I guess we call it a sneak preview trailer of your current project. Can you t set it up and then we'll exit the stage and we'll have we'll show it from the booth and it's a, about a six minute trailer of his current project. You wanna set it up first or you wanna? Sure, um, I, you know, when I was, so when I was in Jerusalem looking for people to be in the movie, um, I met, everyone kept saying, they're the chief rabbi of Israel his nephew is gay, and you should talk to him. So I, m I met this guy named Amichai, and asked him to be in Trembling Before God, and he refused, because he's too much of a diva, and he wanted his own movie. So <laughs> you wait long enough, and you get it. Um, and then, yeah, he's like, I don't do collage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we started filming 12 years ago um, in 2004, and I, he just was ordained as a rabbi in May, and I'm going to start editing in January. And I made this, you know, this tr sort of, I guess, trailer, and been using it in fundraising, and, um, and bringing on people for the project. And this is its world public premiere? I've shown it in, in I've other shown places, in other small places? groups. Okay. Los yeah. Angeles premiere. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm actually really excited to share it with you on a big screen. So we'll, we'll, we'll show it, and then we'll come back up on stage and take some more questions, and then we'll go from there. Okay, okay. let's Thanks. show Rabbi. I probably have 900 hours of footage, <laughs> so it's going to be a long edit. Um, i got to tell you that this is so strange for me because 20 years ago I went to Poland and Israel. I always wanted to go to the concentration camps because my grandmother was in Auschwitz and my aunt and just being a Jew and just, I wanted to feel more. Because mm -hmm. I uh, grew up with my hearing my grandmother say, Hitler killed my family. That was a mantra throughout my entire youth. Hitler killed my family. And whenever there was a certain, there's two types of police sirens, the usual one, every once in a while the police siren will go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so when, when that one came on, she would freak out. So I remember that. And so I purposely wanted to go. So I, I found the Jewish Federation trip where 500 people from across the US went to Poland and Israel. And, and my, the one, the counselor from my group from LA was Amichai's father. I just, yeah, Naftali Levi. So I just saw that, oh my God. So I, I haven't seen my son. He's, and so he told me stories that were amazing that when he, he said when his father was the head of the, sh was the rabbi of the shtetl in Poland, and that the Nazis, when they came to the, sh when they came to the town, the first person they looked for was the rabbi. And if the rabbi did not give himself up, they would kill Jews until the rabbi gave himself up. He says to my father, Amichai's father said to us, my father told us, he says, 
when the Nazis are coming, they knew they were coming. He says, I'm going to give myself up. I'm sending you two boys off. And if by some miracle you survive the war, there's been a lineage of rabbis in our, gen in our, ra in our family for generations. I'm a asking you to become a rabbi. So Naftali Levi told us, he says, when, uh, when the camps were liberated, a lot of the camps the Nazis just ran because the Russians came, the Americans came, and they he said we were just left there. And he said, you, rem his, you remember Naftali, Amichai's uh, father, said, I remember thinking that I was the only Jew in the world, and I, then the thought came to me, my father's thought, that I should become a rabbi. And I said, how could I become a rabbi? I don't even believe. He said, maybe my brother, maybe my brother. He said, so he, so he walked three days to he knew which camp his brother was in. He says, my brother, and that time was the chief rabbi of Israel. So um, he changed his name from Levi. He, he, na name, he named his face Naftali Levi, so he Israelized his name. But so this is Paul Tzvira like that. Wow. I'd love to meet him. David, I wanted to ask you, um, we, I don't know if we, we touched on it briefly, but if you don't mind me asking, how has your faith changed since the film came out? And I mean, after this movie, you can ask me anything. Okay. I'm freezing <laughs> a bit. Um, um, my faith has been, has changed and shifted and moved and in all different directions. In my DNA, in my chromosomes, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I feel most at peace when I'm in Jerusalem, observing the Sabbath, eating kosher, being 100% strict with my partner. Um, that's where I feel most at peace. My soul is feels at peace. Um, but as the years have gone by, I've given up s this tradition or done this or done more of this, less of this. And so I've transitioned to do less practical things, but in my, ep in my core, I'm the same. Mm -hmm. So I feel um, sadness a lot that I don't have what I grew up to be. So I mourn the person that I th that I was raised to be often, mm -hmm. and but also on the same line I also celebrate how I and accept and embrace who I am. So I'm not completely self-actualized. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody is, but I definitely am not. And um, so sometimes it's a struggle, and sometimes mm -hmm. I think, how am I still struggling after all that I've done? I can get my the lifetime achievement award of tr you know of trying you know with ten years of therapy and doing all this stuff and the movie was such a huge thing. I mean, what more can a human being do to say, God, can you please accept me? So, um, I'm, but I'm still I'm still back and forth. But mm -hmm. in my core, I I feel most at peace with who I grew up with. Has have things changed to make it easier for you to find that peace to be a, a part of that? Just in terms of the way the world has responded, you know, the things we've well been well talking about. Well, things have changed. I mean, you know, just being married and being in a relationship has has been total shift. Mm -hmm. um, I never even dreamed of that even being a possibility, mm -hmm. a realistic possibility, or even want. I didn't want it. I only wanted to mar marry marry a woman and have children. And then when I realized that that's not who I am, I could say, well, I want to have brown eyes and I want to be right-handed and, and this is who I am. So it's just part of growing into who you are and accepting everything that you have, mm -hmm. the things that you want, the things that you could have, would have, would have, could have, should have. Um, so I've come to embrace myself with everything that I am and sometimes and often still struggle with things that I grew up wishing I could have. But, but I think for the most part, especi especially being in a relationship, that has been the, the biggest shift in terms of accepting and embracing who I am. Mm -hmm. And also with my closest of friends who I connect with, with my spouse, that 
I don't feel treated any different if my partner was, my spouse was a woman. Mm -hmm. I don't feel, um, and this is in Israel more so than here actually. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Right, not here. We're gonna bring the mic over to you. I just, I wanted to say that the making of the movie and the being in it, it's, I, maybe this is trite to say, but it's such a profound mitzvah in so many ways. So in one way, I feel that what you've done with your struggle is really um, added to the health or the longevity of Judaism because you're changing it in a way that, that allows it to go forward instead of making it something that just can't work and would just fall apart ultimately. What could be more profound? In another way, in just a, in a more um, maybe meat and potatoes way, <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to you our daughter recently came out to us and it was pretty easy for her to tell you the truth certainly compared to what we've seen and it's because of people like you guys that you were so brave and you you you're in kind of a unique position i think in the history of the world that you can kind of s you're able to see the fruits of the effort that you've, what you've done, because the ch you know we're just seeing so much change around us. I don't think people usually s that kind of change in their own lifetime. And um, you know it's so ironic because you've had all these people who say that you're terrible and awful, and none of them can touch the mitzvah that you have done with your lives. And so. Thank you. Another question over here? Thank you. Hi. Uh, so you talked before about the changes that you've seen in this 15 year, since you've had the 15 year screening anniversary. You've had like JQY has done all this stuff. Um, you've seen a lot of change and even just screening this, I'm sure has brought, like you talked about all this positive change. And at the same time, you know, orthodoxy hasn't really moved that much forward. Like, you know, for instance, in my hometown, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, one of the shuls there had a screening of this film, and the rabbi of that shul received a letter from all the other rabbis of the community condemning him for what he did. So I kind of wanted to know what the reaction has been for you guys from screening this film over the last 15 years, and even now, kind of how things have changed for you and how you see the orthodox community. When was the screening in the show in Cleveland? Was it current recently? Oh, so it was really, really. Right. And it's an Orthodox show. I mean, I, you know, change is not linear, and there has been huge shifts, just like Sandy said in Israel, where different, stra different um, Orthodox rabbis c arguing for and against in terms of the whole topic of homosexuality, the gay pride parade, which is recently in Jerusalem, where many were for and many were against. And you're always going to have conflicting reports. And Cleveland is different from LA. Um, Chicago is different from LA. The Midwest is, is, is at least, from I'm a Midwesterner, so I could speak, um, it's, it's different. There's a different mentality, I think, not if you want, if you can generalize, and I think just because, and it's, I'm sorry to hear that, that that in 2016 that that is still happening in Cleveland, but that doesn't mean that things can't change and that things will change because things will change because um, things that are ethically correct, which this film screams, um, 
will happen. And you'll always have people that are on the fence and people on this side that will say, will damn you to hell forever. There'll, there'll always be people on all sides. But I think generally speaking, uh, especially since it's been 15 years since the film started and it was screened in many Orthodox synagogues 15 years ago, a lot in big synagogues in New York City, that there, there have been big shifts. It was screened here in Los Angeles in Orthodox synagogue 15 years ago. Um, and there was a lot of um, acceptance. So, but you're always going to have both. I mean, I'm sorry that to hear that in, in, in your hometown that it, it wasn't treated like that. But um, like I said, change is not linear. And you'll always have people, you'll have people that will never accept. And then you have people that the more they know and the more knowledge they have, um, they will change. And so this film started, I think, was a huge catalyst in starting the whole, the whole process of making people wake up and smell the coffee. And that there, this film was really needed because it's a matter of life and death, um, literally, for many many ki kids. Many kids kill themselves and or are ostracized from their family. And so it, it's 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 not like oh well, I won't go to this party or I mean this is a very serious issue, and if shoals do not address it. Um, I think it, I think it's sinful. I think it's sinful because um, they're pushing. Aw they're pu they don't. I don't think they realize that they're talking. Many of the people that that, that they're speaking to are closeted or are living in marriages and fooling around on the side. And you know, this is a topic that needs to be addressed. So I, I think that in time. You know, as time passes, things will change more and more. But things have shifted hugely. And also, even in, in Israel, they've, there's been huge, huge changes with the Orthodox rabbi making all kinds of edicts about acceptance and respect. So there, there's overall, there's been huge, huge changes. And I really feel a lot of it, I don't know for sure, is directly related to, to this film. I mean, I'm just amazed to hear what you just said, which is Cleveland. Like, ow. Like, I didn't even, I mean, that's the thing, is that I, don't e I didn't even know about that. I mean, things are happening in communities all around the world with this issue with the film that the fact that it wasn't just a dirty secret that no one in Cleveland spoke about, that the rabbis would not touch publicly, that, you know, that it was either sin or sickness and there was those were the twin poles and that's it. The fact that like Orthodox rabbis are battling it out in public in a smaller city in America, you know, that's not one of the hubs of New York or LA is pretty major. So, you know, I mean, having just also come from Jerusalem, so Amichai, Amichai in rabbi, his brother is a big Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem. He's the one I was talking about before who was going up against other rabbis. I mean, Amichai had told me, he said, my brother will never be in the movie. It will be political suicide. It will be completely risky. He will never do it. And I wrote this, in, and Amichai's brother, who's Orthodox, came to, so Amichai is ordained conservative. Um, so you, for people who don't know, there's like reconstructionist renewal, reform, conservative, Orthodox. You know, when I began the film, conservative Judaism, if you were outed as a lesbian or gay rabbi, you'd be thrown out of the seminary. You could not become a rabbi, a gay or lesbian rabbi in conservative Judaism. I remember when we did the screening in 2002 at the conservative rabbinic conference. They wouldn't allow us to screen it in the conference. We had to screen it down the hill, and we had like 80 rabbis and yarmulkes like trudge down this hill to a screening room. And they decided by 2006 to re-examine the law, and they allowed for the first time in history the ordaining of openly gay and lesbian rabbis in conservative Judaism. Um, which broke the doors of the seminary, and that's why Amichai just was ordained as a gay conservative rabbi um, in May. So, you know, these things do have ripple effects. 
Um, and, you know, going to Israel and having Amichai's Orthodox rabbi brother agree to be in the movie and speak so openly and lovingly about his gay brother who is who he disagrees with on a lot of political levels, ideological levels. They come from movements that do not, you know, see eye to eye. It's sort of liberal and orthodox, but there's there's blends and there's boundaries that are shifting and and you know and and you know since so last Pride in Jerusalem, an ultra orthodox man stabbed five, six people and one of them was killed. Shira Banki, who is 16 years old, straight ally. Um, and since then, every week, there has been a group of people who have organized dialogue circle on the street in Kikar Zion in the middle of Jerusalem. And it is queer, straight, orthodox, non-orthodox, Palestinian, Jewish, wh whoever comes, whoever just comes. And this is the heart of the city. People are flowing. And there's arguments, and there's revelations, and there's talking, and it's really extraordinary. And someone can come and just stab everyone right there, and, th and then they put their bodies on the line for the sake of a public town square and to have the conversations that matter most. And Amichai and his brother had led this dialogue together when I was just there filming them. And it was just amazing. So I. I don't know. And then the next day was Pride, and 25, 30,000 people marched. Um, this was five times as many people as they thought would come. And there were so many Orthodox people marching in solidarity. Um, and it was a Jerusalem that, you know, was cha like Jeru now Jerusalem Pride for Israelis represents what they want their country to be for many people. They want this to be an inclusive, open, progressive place, even a lot of the Orthodox people marching. So for me, there was like just witnessing that and being able to film these past days with Amichai's brother and pride. It was just, it was incredible. It was really, so I have some optimism now coming back from that experience a few weeks ago. But yeah, there are places that it hasn't permeated and hasn't changed, but but history does march on. Well, on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sandy and David, for being with us here today.